Good morning, everybody. Welcome to church this morning. It's great to be able to join with you, uh, even in the presence of your home, and to praise our God together. So please join in as we uh, use the Sunday morning service this morning in the daily services. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Glory to God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as in the beginning, so now and forever. Amen. O come, let us sing out loud to the Lord. Let us shout in triumph to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his face with thanksgiving and cry out to him joyfully in psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth and the peaks of the mountains are his also. The sea is his and he made it. His hands moulded dry land. Come, let us worship and bow down and kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is the Lord our God, and we are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Today, if only you would hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as Israel did in the wilderness, when your forebears tested me, put me to proof, though they had seen my works. Forty years long I loathed that generation, and I said, It is a people who err in their hearts, for they do not know my ways, of whom I swore in my, oath, in my wrath, they shall never enter my rest. Well, friends, the night has passed, and the day lies open before us. So let us pray with one heart and one mind. As we rejoice in the gift of this new day, so may the light of your presence, O God, set our hearts on fire with love for you, now and forever. Amen. So folks, if you'd like to join in, uh, please sing in with this praise song.
Lord God, whose blessed Son rose in triumph and set us free, grant us the fullness of life he promised us, that through the Holy Spirit our hearts may possess him whom our eyes cannot see, the same Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We're going to hear from God's word now as we listen to a couple of Bible readings and then the sermon. Today's Bible reading is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 9, verses 1 to 13. Jesus stepped into a boat, crossed over, and came to his own town. Some men brought to him a paralysed man lying on a mat. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the man, Take heart, son, your sins are forgiven. At this, some of the teachers of the law said to themselves, This fellow is blaspheming. Knowing their thoughts, Jesus said, Why do you entertain evil thoughts in your hearts? Which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Get up and walk? But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralysed man, Get up. Take your mat and go home. Then the man got up and went home. When the crowd saw this, they were filled with awe, and they praised God, who had given such authority to man. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him, and Matthew got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, for I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. This is the word of the Lord. Good day. Thank you for the opportunity of sharing with you today. And uh, it's just so great to share with your church. Last year when I was there, um, it was a a kind of different environment. I was able to cook for some of you and and, and share a little bit more about what Bible League is doing in the field. And uh, so it's good to be back, even though it's uh, via a video link this year. Today's reading is from Acts 8, uh, one of the foundational verses from, for Bible League. And uh, we start in verse 26. And it says, Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to the Gaza. So he started out, and on his way, he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Kandak, which means the queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to the chariot and stay near to it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you are reading? Philip asked. How can I? He said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come and sit with him. This is the passage of scripture the eunuch was reading. He was like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, He was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, Tell me please, who is the prophet speaking about? Himself or someone else? Then Philip began with the very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they travelled along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What can stand in the way of my being baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again, 
but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared to Azotus and traveled about preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. The Acts 8 story is one of the foundational stories in Bible League and one of our discipleship and evangelism programs is in fact called Project Philip. What stands out in the story is the impossibility of this encounter taking place without the leading of God. It is definitely not something that man can plan for. Yet, at the same time, we know that without the obedience of Philip, this Ethiopian man would not have known Christ. Philip was led by God. We see the wonder of God's leading, and we also see the beauty of a man's obedience in the fulfillment of God's purposes. Throughout Luke, we see numerous examples of the leading of the Holy Spirit, and this is no exception. We have here one man who stands little chance of knowing Christ, an outsider with an outside chance. Yet he was God-fearing. Although without a full knowledge of God, he made that long 800 kilometer journey from Ethiopia to Jerusalem, wanting to worship God. Now that's not the modern day Ethiopia that we know, but it's the biblical one just south of Egypt. We could tell the longing in his heart. He bought a copy of the scriptures with him to read. He might not know God, but God knows him. The one who seeks him with all his heart will find him. You see, God sets up divine appointments. In verse 26, Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. Why Philip? He knows Christ. He is a Grecian Jew. He speaks Greek. He has the answer that the man needs. He knows the scripture. He knows Isaiah 53. He was prepared to give an answer to everyone who asked him. To give the reason for his hope that he has. So he started out in verse 27 immediately. And this is crucial. Because when you need to meet someone on the move, without a prior arrangement, you need to do it immediately. It's difficult to hit a moving target. But the Lord's call and Philip's response were both very timely. Philip responded in faith, not knowing why, because the angel did not explain it to Philip. Philip trusts that God has his reasons. When he reached the road, he saw the chariot. In verse 29, the Spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah, the prophet. Do you understand what you are reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and to sit with him. You see, God guided Philip to this man. God directed him at each step of the way. This is the same as what we do in the field. We draw alongside people and we help them to understand the Bible. The timing was precise. Philip left promptly. He reached the chariot in time. He ran by it in time to overhear the reading of Isaiah and Isaiah 53 at that. Philip latched on to the written word and presented Christ to this man. What a revelation this was to this man. He understood, he believed, and he was baptized. This was another difficult feat, finding some water in the middle of a desert place for him to be able to be baptized. Only God could have arranged that. We have an outsider who has the right heart. He got to know Christ. He believed and was baptized. You see, baptism doesn't mean anything if we don't know Christ. Philip said to the man, repent and ask for forgiveness. Baptism by itself does not make us Christians. Do you really know Jesus? That's the big question we need to be asking ourselves today. I want to share with you a story from Indonesia. Uh, during these COVID times, one of the opportunities we've had has been in Indonesia. 
Now, in many parts around the world, our ministry has actually been curtailed and reduced, but not so in Indonesia. In fact, God has set up impossible encounters in Indonesia. Our national director in Indonesia, uh, Tony, has had the opportunity to connect with various government officials over this time. And uh, you might have heard stories before where we are working in the slums in Indonesia. And uh, the average family within the slum earns about $1.60 a day. So that's a family and, and they have two husband and wife, two adults and around four children on average. And they live on $1.60 a day. Now those kind of conditions are obviously not great when COVID comes along and uh, you know you need to have higher degrees of sanitation and also social distancing. And so what the government did was they wanted to get these people into uh, community centers, into school halls, into tented accommodation that they created and they'd set up in order for the people to live in a better sanitation environment. And uh, part of what they, they offered these people was they said to them, how about if you come and live in these uh, venues that we've created for you, we will actually give you literacy. <laughs> and of course, this was the literacy program that's being offered by Babali. So it's Bible-based literacy. We are talking the most Muslim nation in the world offering Bible-based literacy. And the invitation has come from the government. <laughs> so only God can set up something like that. That is a true miracle. And so we are seeing uh, that those people started coming they started uh, enrolling for the, the course. Uh, we originally said we'd be able to cater for 1,000 people in one particular village. 2,800 registered. And then, not only that, after we had uh, started the course for those 2,800, we split them into, into various groups and ran different courses at different times. Um, but when we'd already started that, some of the senior government officials from neighboring villages also said, we want our people to undergo the same literacy training. And so what happened was that spilled over to 16 different villages around that initial village. And so as a result, over 30,000 people got enrolled and completed Bible-based literacy. And this is in Indonesia, which is the most Muslim country in the world. And so we can see that God can set up incredible encounters something that might be impossible to man, but that is very, very possible to God. That's just one story of uh, what we see. And God will direct when it matters most. You see, God speaks through an angel, through the prompting of the Holy Spirit, and through his written word. And he directs Philip to this man, this Ethiopian, and he guides him to a faith in Jesus Christ. You see, God guides Philip progressively. God tells him enough for him to act, but God doesn't reveal everything to him. And he doesn't ask him to explain. That's what most of us like to do. We want to know the whole plan. Come on, Lord, tell me everything. He says, go south to the road. We want to know why. If he says, run to the chariot and stay near it, we ask, what for? Who's going to be there? <laughs> God speaks when Philip needs to know. Philip trusts God. That's faith. When we obey what God has revealed to us, we do what he says and we trust that God will show us the next step when we need to know. A little story from myself is when I came to Australia, I originally didn't really know what I was going to do here. I just knew that God wanted me in Australia. And so I resigned my job and we sold our house. We put our stuff into storage and we were literally waiting. We were waiting on the Lord. And um, if you speak to any of my non-Christian mates, they would have said to you, Hilton's gone crazy uh, because he's following a calling to go to Australia. My Christian mates fully understood what was going on. But uh, we literally waited uh, for months, uh, waiting for the Lord. And eventually... I really just felt in my heart that I needed to just get on a plane. And so 
uh, we got on a plane. We could only get a three-month travel visa. And we got on the plane, we got our, th our three-month travel visa, we got on the plane and we flew to Australia. Now, I'd originally expected that God would line everything up for me. I thought, here we go, he, he wants me to go to Australia, so he's going to organize me a great job in a great Christian organization, ahead of going, etc., etc. But that wasn't the case. You see, God was leading me, but he wasn't going to reveal the entire picture. And so, in 2011, we came across to Australia. And... Uh, that three-month visa has extended. And so nine years later, I'm still here sharing a message with you. And that's just a practical example of how God can use us. You see, when you get to the place that God wants you to be, you will understand, just like Philip did, he heard the man reading from Isaiah 53, which was the reference to the Messiah and which Jesus had fulfilled in his death on the cross. Naturally, Philip asked, do you understand what you are reading? The man said no, and the rest just flowed out from there. The man was reading Isaiah 53, verse 7 and 8. Philip used that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. In hindsight, Philip would have understood why the Lord directed him to that particular passage. You see, God wants to save this man. This one man's conversation alone is worth the trip. And that's like each and every one of us when we set out in obedience. But the even better part is that history tells us very likely this Ethiopian became a missionary amongst these people. Irenaeus, the church father in the second century, wrote in his book, called Against Heresies, about this Ethiopian. The first missionaries to Ethiopia also saw a church that was founded by a court official, this same Ethiopian. You see, Luke places this encounter here in Acts 8 as the gospel moves to Samaria and beyond. In, it, in his way of telling us that the gospel cannot be stopped, whatever the impossibilities may get in the way. Samaritans, an outsider, an enemy, Gentiles, it doesn't matter. God and his word have the power to change lives. That's all lives. Whatever the culture, whatever the race, whatever the nationality, no geographical or cultural or social barriers can be a hindrance to the gospel. The message of Jesus transcends all. God's love knows no boundaries. There's a children's Sunday school song that uh, you might know. It says, Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. And how true isn't that? You see, all lives matter to God. When we were going about our ministry in Zimbabwe earlier this year during the COVID time as well, we had an opportunity to connect with the government in Zimbabwe. And uh, the government said to our partners there, they said, we want to go out and educate the nation about COVID. And unfortunately, because they don't have good radio, they don't have good television, they couldn't really use those mediums. So what they did have was the opportunity to go out and share one-on-one -on -one with the people. And so that's what they wanted to do. But unfortunately for the government, they didn't know each and every village. But because Bible League works in rural areas, the workers on the ground for Bible League, the volunteers that are there, knew each and every village, how to get there and the people to connect with in every village. And so what happened was the government asked Bible League, can you please take us to every village across the entire country? And uh, so really what happened was Bible League joined forces with the government health workers for a whole month and they went out government sponsored government-sponsored revival happened in Zimbabwe. It was incredible to see that uh, our workers went out with the, with the government officials and uh, the government officials spoke to the, the groups about COVID-19 and explained sanitation and social distancing. But our people were able to share Project Philip 
and the love of Jesus and pray with those people. So we saw something in Zimbabwe that was absolutely incredible. In fact, we reached, in one month, we reached 10 times the number of people that we would normally reach in Zimbabwe in a full year. And so you can see that God is working powerfully right across the world through the ministry of Bible League and, and creating impossible encounters. Friends, do we trust God's leading? When He guides us, do we listen? When He directs us, do we obey? I know for myself that if I'm honest, the answer is not always. <laughs> this was no coincidence. Philip was led to a man to be in the right place at the right time to do the right thing for God. Ultimately, what made Philip's witness successful wasn't his technique in evangelism, but it was his obedience to God. If we know Jesus, if we know the meaning of Isaiah 53, if we have tasted God's saving grace, then we too can be the person that God can use. We know that God is sovereign and He guides. So we can become the right person led by God to be at the right place, at the right time, to do the right thing for Christ and to bless someone's life. My prayer for you today is that you will find that quiet place in the busyness of your daily lives and that you will listen to that still small voice and when you hear it, that you will run just like the Ethiopian. Almighty God, as Jesus wept at the grave of his friend, we come to you grieving at the reality of the world's present suffering. In our great need and on behalf of our local and global communities, we cry to you for help and healing, for strength and wisdom. Help your church as your ambassadors to live boldly in word and deed, that our hope and love may bring life to the world. Give us humility to learn all you are trying to teach us, and may your careful pruning produce in us a harvest of righteousness. May we seize this opportunity for spiritual growth and leadership within our own households, even as we grieve not being able to meet together. O God, Father, Son and Spirit, although we will diligently work to overcome this pandemic, you are our greatest hope and we look to you to save and restore us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
let us say the canticle that's uh, from Luke chapter 1. If you want to join in, please do. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who has come to his people and set them free. The Lord has raised up for us a mighty saviour, born of the house of his servant David. Through the holy prophets, God promised of old to save us from our enemies, from the hands of all who hate us, to show mercy to our forebears and to remember his holy covenant. This was the oath God swore to our father Abraham, to set us free from the hands of our enemies, free to worship him without fear, holy and righteous before him all the days of our life. And you, child, shall be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his way, to give his people knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins. In the tender compassion of our God, the dawn from on high shall break upon us, to shine on those who dwell in darkness and the shadow of death, and to guide our feet into the way of peace. So friends, shall we affirm the things that we believe by saying together the Apostles' Creed? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Amen. As we enter into a time of prayer, let us pray, Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. And let's pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, Thank you that we can come before you and we can talk to you at any time of day and it doesn't matter where we are, you still hear us. Thank you for the many blessings that you give to us and we thank you for the gradual easing of restrictions. Thank you that we are able to meet outside in larger groups and inside in small groups. Thank you for the opportunity where we can pray, read your word together and encourage each other in our faith during these challenging times. Help us, Lord, to be a blessing to the communities that you have planted us in. And we pray that we won't be people who grumble or complain, but we'll look for opportunities where we can be a shining light to those we meet. Lord, we continue to pray for the leaders in Australia and around the world as they navigate their way through COVID-19. Protect them from corruption, and we pray that you'll give them wisdom and direct their work and influence their decisions to the advancement of your glory. We continue to pray for those who have been affected from COVID-19. Be with those who are sick, grieving, as well as the doctors and the nurses who are serving in this global pandemic. We continue to pray for those who are in lockdown and are struggling with, restrict with restriction fatigue. Help them to act wisely and to think of others. In Victoria, we have faced isolation and lockdown but I don't think that many of us would know what it is like to live in a country that faces persecution and it is illegal to meet together to worship you. Thank you for the freedom that we have in Australia and we continue to pray for the persecuted countries around the world. In particular, we bring before you the country of Egypt. 
We pray for God's hand to be on the church in Egypt, and we pray for the safety of those who leave Islam to follow Jesus. Strengthen them in their faith and give them a boldness and your peace as they trust in you. Lord, we pray for the upcoming elections in America, and we ask God that you will raise up leaders who are committed to justice, righteousness, humility and truth. And Lord, we thank you for the members from Strathfield State Community Church and from Holy Trinity. Thank you for each person who makes up our churches and that each person is important and special. Thank you for the youngest member through to the oldest member. Thank you that it doesn't matter what our age is, we can be a blessing to each other. And I pray that as we navigate our way back to meeting together, that we will all find our fit. That you will help members to discover how each of us can serve you as we meet in ways that are different to what we are used to. Help us, Lord, to continue to keep our eyes on you, to daily read your word and spend time with you in prayer. And with exams coming up, we continue to pray for the teens and the young adults and others who have exams. Help them to, to be motivated to study, to not procrastinate, to not put unrealis unrealistic expectations on themselves and to be able to recall what they need to for their exams. And Lord, we bring before you those we know who are sick and in the stillness of our hearts, can I encourage you to bring before God anyone you know who is sick at this time. Be with their doctors, their nurses, and those who are caring for these people. Give them wisdom and patience so that they can care for them in the best way possible. Thank you, Lord, that even in the midst of all that is going on around us, we can come before you knowing that you are our strength and our refuge. Help us to continually talk to you, to listen to you, and to remember all the good things that you have done for us. Amen. as we finish the service today. Let me pray this prayer over us. Eternal God and Father, by whose power we are created and by whose love we are redeemed, guide and strengthen us by your spirit that we may give ourselves to your service and live this day in love to one another and to you through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So friends, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. See you next time. His righteousness.